Hey, Scott. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you as well, my friend. How are you, Robin? I am doing well, you know, just uh, adjusting to the spring weather out here a little bit. But uh, other than that, you know, pretty, pretty good. What about yourself? How's everything uh, in California right now? Everything's good. Everything's good. Just coming off uh, spring break for my wife and the boys. So we got a little uh, vacation, but local vacation didn't get too far away, but um, always Disney, good. Right? Just spend some time. Yeah. Two days yeah. at Disney. Uh, full disclosure for all the parents out there. One amazing day, one not so amazing day. Uh, we crashed on day two, but uh, <laughs> but that's that's the deal. That's how you that's how you do it. And we still had a great time, though. Yeah, uh, you know, vacations are just great just for, to recharge. I I also just came back yeah. from a, a, a small getaway as well, and it's it it's a great reminder uh, for people to to step away and you know disconnect a little bit and and get some recharge time in because it's so vital for our our you know emotional health and uh, I think for our physical health too. So I'm glad you Absolutely. got to step away with your 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 loved ones, your family. So yeah, you too. Any highlights from your trip? You were in a beautiful part of the world, that's for sure. Uh, you know, we just, we love going down to Mexico. So, uh, yeah, we just got to spend some time there and, uh, you know, just not have to make any decisions, which was the, <laughs> the beautiful part of the whole getaway was, right. you know, just see where the day takes you. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of do decision. I have, do I have chicken? Do I have eggs? Do I have pancakes? Those, that's the extent of your big time decision. Making, Pilatas, right? margaritas, mojitos. Right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Love it. The important stuff. Yeah, so no, well, I'm um you know excited to bring on our guest this evening, um and and so everybody out here can learn from this amazing MIE expert, family member of ours, and just all around upstanding school leader in the New York area. And, and I do want to kind of just take a, a minute to also you know um, send our our thoughts with all those that are experiencing the tragedy today in New York as well. So um, it's not to, to go without uh, speaking about, and, you know, hopefully one day we can live in a world of peace. We're just not quite there yet. So, um, but yeah, excited well, to bring on our guest though. So should we do that? Uh, yeah, we can do it. Let's bring him on. Welcome uh, Mr. Sean Arnold to the show. Oh, look, I magically pop in. <laughs> That's a neat little trick. Thank you for your thoughts, Ron. Yet, yeah, like I said before, today's the kind of days where my mom, I grew up in Illinois, is always texting me, is everything cool? Is everything all right? And, you know, my my uh, other family members upstate are like, all good. But uh, now you have me excited about my spring break starts on Friday, and I feel desperately in need of it. And yeah. so I'm looking forward to the vacation that is to come for me. So, yeah, there you go. There well, enjoy every minute of it, and we're glad that you and your, your loved ones are safe uh, today, Sean. Uh, Sean, do you just want to kind of share a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do uh, for New York, and uh, what your kind of role is? And Sure. Uh, I am a special educator and STEM coach in New York City's District 75. Um, it's New York City's huge 1.2. 2 million students, da, da, da. District 75 is the citywide district uh, for students with higher needs disabilities. So it's citywide. All the students in my district have IEPs. It's like 26, 27,000 students. Um, and I have worked there for 17, 18-ish years now, and about 18 years at this point now, by the end of this year, uh, in District 75. Uh, and STEM is my jam, and I help coach teachers, and I've taught kids, and last year I was one of the few teachers who was actually in person with students at a school in Brooklyn and 4K. I don't know. I do a lot of stuff. I started as a music teacher, actually. That's fascinating. Fun times. But all the things. Thank you for your service for so many years in education. Uh, you're Absolutely. earning a lot of gold stars. <laughs> you know, some years have been better than others, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Welcome to teaching, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some days are better than others, some weeks. So, yeah. yeah. Such is the life. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll say, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. You're still trying. Oh, no, I was just going to say some of the things that have been really, really awesome over the years, though, in this sort of a district is the fact that the students all come with very unique challenges. We have a large population of students with autism, for example, and a lot of students with physical disabilities. It means that all the other stuff that a lot of other teachers and other places are sort of obligated to in very those traditional rote methods of teaching we already know don't work for our kids 
so, you know, I get to try and experiment and do a whole lot of other things that uh, I found are really meaningful uh, for the families and the communities that we serve. So it's been really fun most of the time. <laughs> So in general, um, can you do, just kind of double click on what you just said? Can you share maybe um, a couple of things that you have, you know, done or have been in practice with that, that actually works with some of these uh, learners that maybe other people are just now trying or they haven't figured out quite that yet, yet that other thing doesn't work, but you should actually do this. Would you want to share a couple of ideas of what actually has been really successful for you all? Well, in the area of pedagogy, uh, you know, teaching stuff, big word for teaching, um, is <laughs> stuff, uh, we get to do a lot of hands-on learning with students, a lot of small group work with students, a lot of major like design projects with students, and I get to do a ton of game-based learning. You know, in my early, more venerable days as a teacher, that looked like me putting out a, uh, a, a sort of game board that, that would be, I guess, the equivalent of, of a twister, Right. Except instead of all the different colors and things, it would be concepts that we were learning. So in music, it would, might be notation or it might be words or vocabulary things. And I quickly learned that the students don't know their left from their right. So then I go ahead and run to the dollar store and I make like little socks and gloves and things that we're able to use with like the little letters and L's and R's. And then they start learning their left and their right. And so doing it through these kinesthetic ways and through these uh, ways in which they're able to engage meaningfully in things rather than just sit back and receiving information was really effective and meaningful, not only in just, yes, imparting the information to students, but also in them collaborating and communicating with each other, because communication was always a big issue, especially for the students with autism. So yes, that is the pedagogy that's helped, but even more so a lot of the technology that I started to use early on that I found was really effective for the sake of accessibility. So my students who couldn't always communicate with words verbally, we could set up systems, digital systems, where it could read the words to them and it could have them communicate the word. For people who are less familiar with this sort of concept, if, if you if you know who Stephen Hawking was, think of a system sort of like that, uh, where he communicated all the brilliance of his mind, but not through his mouth, through the system that shared his thoughts with the world around him. And, and it's like that for a lot of my students. So yeah. So between, between the cool things we were able to engage with in terms of instruction and also the technology we were able to incorporate to make the learning accessible and inclusive for those students, I, I think those came a long way in major moments and small ones where it's just one student who, who was able to express verbally in a way they never had before. And some of, sometimes those small things are my very favorite moments that I remember in my whole career of teaching. Yeah. That's that's kind of why we get into this in the first place, right? Those moments where you really see the learning happening, regardless of what grade you teach, what subject, what student population you teach. Those are those those true moments for sure. Uh, also, Sean, we had I, a chance. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was just saying. Also, if I had taught into a more traditional environment, I probably wouldn't have gotten to play Minecraft with my students a good ten <laughs> years ago, like I was. So yeah, been doing <laughs> that great with the kids too. There's perks to the job, right? Definitely. Sean, a lot of what you're talking about with accessibility and inclusion um, really comes back to how we design the learning environment, right? And we had we had a great conversation in, in Texas a couple months ago at TCEA about designing learning for all. Um, how do you see that positively affecting students, both in, with the group that you work with, students with special needs, but also how does that translate to other students as well, this idea of designing for all? What, what does that look like in a learning space? So there's this concept, universal design for learning. Uh, and, and we're basically putting things in place that yes, are for people with specific disabilities, but they actually serve everybody. Uh, outside of a classroom, this could look something like, hey, look at a crosswalk, we have a little ramp that goes down with all the little yellow dots here in New York City, right? So that people in wheelchairs can cross the street, but it doesn't just help the people with wheelchairs, it actually helps people with strollers. It helps people who are carrying their laundry to the laundromat down the block. It helps people with their suitcases coming over from JFK. Oh, and those little yellow dots that are there so that a visually impaired person, when they walk out, know when the street ends and so they don't go walking out into traffic. That also helps so you don't go slipping out into the snow when it gets wintertime here in New York City. And so these are things that serve everybody, even if they're designed initially for a subgroup of people. So in a classroom, you know, nobody wants to be isolated. Nobody wants to be ostracized, obviously. Um, 
and you can get tools that are easy to use, say a Flipgrid, right? Where it's easy because all the kids nowadays from like age two on know how to click a thing and record a video and watch it, whether it's TikTok or whatever it is. And, and, and Flipgrid totally taps into that. And, and I know a lot of times in education, we talk about voice and choice, but it's really, really huge and meaningful for my students because a lot of them don't have the quote traditional voice, whether it's speaking with American Sign Language or speaking with an assistive technology piece or often not being given the choice because people assume they have certain limitations. But the biggest piece is giving them that increased independence that a lot of times can come through the technology, that can come through these adaptive tools. Um, for example, you know, the way that now with computers, a person can speak to the device and have it do whatever they want and send their message and send their email and dictate it completely and then go over to their app and have it zoom in on their photos and crop out what they want all with the power of their voice, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now they can do that independently and they don't need someone there with them. And for people who don't have the power of their voice, they can have a switch in their head. And so if they have limited physical mobility wherever it is on their body or maybe down by their hand, they can go ahead and interact with whatever it is on the device and be as fully independent, at least in that area of their life and carry on as fully in that way as possible and even become advocates for themselves once they have that level of independence because that's really the goal, right? I have ideas for my life, as do all of them. Here's what I want for my future and let them advocate for the, themselves as much as they possibly can. Yeah. And that's what we want for all the students, regardless of ability or disability or challenges that they might be facing, whether it's, yes, something that's on an IEP or it's you know something within their community that's a challenge. And by designing a space where they don't even have to ask for those adaptations, where they're automatically there, where they're automatically available, it just makes it better for everybody. And then you're not ostracized by even having to ask. Yeah, it really kind of just gets rid of a lot of that stigma, you know, stigmatization that students typically or historically have had because they needed assistive technology device or maybe they needed cover overlays on their paper or whatever, but something or they, you know, maybe needed uh, something to be read aloud to them, et cetera. And before, you know, everybody knew like, oh, that kid over there has gets this extra thing. And now, you know, it, it's become more seamless where students who need those extra accommodations have the access to them. And then, like you said, we're starting to see students who didn't have it in their IEP check that they needed something are also leveraging these uh, services as well, which, you know, at Microsoft, this has obviously been a really big priority and a focus for us for the last several years is really to make sure that we're addressing accessibility and inclusion and how we build our technology products. And I can't tell you the number of times that I hear people uh, share how they're leveraging some of this assistive technology that's built in. Um, and they, like, like I said, they, they don't have, you know, a, a, an extra checkbox needed for this thing, right? So like, I know recently I was chatting with somebody uh, about immersive reader and, you know, it was originally our engineers kind of had created in a hackathon to try to figure out how do they support, how does our technology support those with dyslexia, right? That's what, that's initially what was the problem was like, how do we do this? And then immersive reader was born, but then now I hear folks say, oh yeah, like my students in my gifted class, they use immersive reader to play back the, the, the essays that they're writing for their AP English classes to make sure that they're, you know, um, not making mistakes or they're kind of self editing and correcting themselves by hearing themselves play back their own writing. Right. So yeah, that gifted student didn't need an accommodation, but they're still leveraging the tools that were built for those who did need it. Right. And so it, it's that um, empowering everybody to get more out of something versus, you know, Oh, we're just doing this one thing for this group of uh, students or learners or adults. Right. And everybody benefits from the outcome. So I just, I love seeing how that's pervasive and how we design learning. It's pervasive in how we're trying to design technology here at Microsoft. Um, but with that, you know, obviously you're a teacher who has really embraced technology with your students, as you shared, um, you know, I want you to kind of dig in a little bit more on what you do with, with Minecraft and how you've really kind of, you know, you're the father of uh, special education in Minecraft, uh, really across the, the country, I feel like everybody looks up to you in that, that ma manner. But um, how did you get started doing something like that? And then how do you encourage or support maybe that reticent educator who doesn't quite understand why it's so it can be so powerful? 
Okay. Well, I'll, I'll start with how I got started, but I, I love that you bring up Immersive Reader in it because now it's also available in Minecraft. But uh, and, it, and it was such a huge game changer for my teachers. And I've seen ways in which, yes, it was being used by students and gifted programs, but you think the translator in it is for multilingual learners who are coming in and learning. But I've seen situations where uh, students were actually studying learning French and German and other languages in language class. And it's been utilized for that, for them to go back and forth between those two languages, which was not its original intended use, but it's awesome. Um, I'll say Immersive Reader is actually one of those tools that's helped me pull in some of those reticent teachers. But I'll, I'll talk about the Minecraft and what I've done to get into it first. I'll say that, like I was saying, one of the most impactful things for my students and one of the key tenets of universal design for learning is engagement. And so game-based learning, because I was always a gamer and loved it, brought into my classroom and it's been immensely meaningful for my students. And yes, it might've started with sort of twister things, but we got into digital environments and creation tools and my students already loved Minecraft. It was just something that they were wanting to do on their own anyway. So how can I incorporate this and bring this in to teach uh, learning modules that we're gonna be doing anyway in science and math, right? And so I did, and we had all these design projects related to the geography and geometry and other things that we're doing. And one of the things that sort of hit me even recently as I was pondering is all the ways that these game-based learning tools and these accessibility tools have merged together. Uh, one very recently specific to Microsoft is we use eye gaze tracking systems for students with physical impairments. So that way they can interact with the screen. And it, for people who are not familiar, it's basically, this is a system that tracks where someone's eyes are looking because they have limited movement. And I've seen people with those eye gaze tracking systems play amazing games from like World of Warcraft and beyond that are really complex and move quicker and do things that I, with a mouse and a, and a <laughs> keyboard and all this stuff, I'm like struggling to keep up. I'm like, okay. And that's amazing. And apparently now Dynamox, who works and connects these things to the Windows computers, is now selling all these eye gaze tracking systems to gamers, which is a whole separate community who want them fully abled gamers. Now, there are systems and things that are set up for disabled gamers and awesome communities for that that I've connected with. But now fully able gamers, this is a tool that they hadn't even conceived of. So that's that whole universal design piece. But as to reticent teachers, how I pull them in, uh, you know, they don't necessarily get as excited about the huge gamer thing as I would, but you know, no faulting them. Uh, I've had situations where I'll, I'll, I'll walk in and be working with a couple of teachers and I don't start with the technology because it's not about the technology. Uh, the technology is just the tool to get them to the other goal that they'd already want to have for their students, right? Um, and so we're about connecting them to what they're passionate about for their students in education. So I might ask them questions like, hey, do you want your students to be more creative? Uh, do you want to be able to quickly assess your students and visualize what their strengths and weaknesses are very, very quickly? Do you, do you wanna know what your students are doing deeply in their community and what the challenges are they're facing and then connect them to other people in the world as they come up with solutions for them. And one of the big ones is, and do you want to have time to do all that without adding anything extra to your plate? You know, technology can help with that. Uh, in a specific example, moving back to Immersive Reader, there's something in Immersive Reader that are picture symbols, right? And they're powered by BoardMaker. And I bet you at least 85 to 90% of educators and anybody else watching this has never, ever heard of BoardMaker. But in my district, it is the software that you could probably go around and 98% of teachers know what it is because it's heavily used for communication symbols for students with autism. And teachers who, I don't do technology, it's not my thing. No, I don't like computers. What do you think about BoardMaker? I love BoardMaker, it's great. It's amazing because it is the communication tool they know for using with their students. But I will tell you this, BoardMaker is cool for what it does, but it's complicated and clunky and kind of hard to use comparatively to other easy to use software. Hey, Immersive Reader literally has it built in automatically from an easily typed text. So look, you can get your picture symbols with a text that you pulled from wherever you got it from. You didn't have to do any, any extra work to put it or pull it together. So now you not only get this tool that you already love and that connects to your students meaningfully, but now you just save yourself about a whole prep period getting it. So now, now I gave you time, which is probably the best thing you can give teachers. Here's extra time. Yeah. <laughs>
Absolutely. So yeah, that, I guess that's how I do it is like you, it's not about, Hey, this technology piece, it's about what do you want to do? What's meaningful? How do you want to connect with the students deeply? Let's get there and let me show you how you can get there even quicker and more meaningfully with your students and technology is usually the answer. Yeah. I appreciate Sean so much that you mentioned this idea that technology is a tool. I think we've seen so many examples even pre-pandemic of schools that just threw devices in the classroom, right? Re regardless of what device or platform or app or, or group of apps they chose, they just kind of threw it out there and didn't think about that essential question you asked and do ask your teachers, which is what's your goal? You know, what do you, what do you want for your students? So I guess I, I would just ask you to kind of follow up on that and say, how do, how do we encourage those deeper conversation is not not every school has a or district has a Sean Arnold that can be a champion you know what what can we do to inspire teachers as we see a record number of teachers exiting the profession and you know being up to here with the stress how do we open teachers eyes to the possibility of what these conversations can bring to education and where it can go in the future I mean I think some of it just starts with that initial question so too often we start with this question especially with educational technology of what Right. Like what devices do we want to get? Um, mm -hmm. What's going to get us to one to one most quickly? What's going to efficiently let us manage these things? And some of these are worthwhile and useful questions, but I definitely don't think they should be the initial question. Why is a better question. Why do we want to engage with these? Why is this essential for student learning? But even better, I think, is probably who. Who is it we're trying to connect with? Who are they? Who are they? in terms of their needs? Who are they in terms of what they want for their life? Who are they in terms of the challenges that they're facing and the obstacles that exist in this world around them? And how can we address the who, right? And then we can figure out what the what's and all that other things that we can get to. I will say in terms of a lot of <laughs> weird things that are going well, there, there are places that you can find success and accessibility where things are connecting to students. And I don't wanna use this as an example because there's negative stuff there, but I'll say TikTok, right? All, everybody, every kid in the world is familiar with all the things coming from it, all the trends and all the things that are happening, but there are amazing things that they're doing well, even in terms of accessibility. They've built a culture of captioning, right? Where captioning is a key feature and they've recognized that it's an accessibility piece. Their communities, that are full on American Sign Language, ASL communities and communities for ADHD and autism where people can speak and share openly and all about mental health and the struggles that they're facing. And, and at least once a week, and I don't have them there a whole bunch, I'll see somebody in a comment say, why did I never learn this stuff in school, right? Mm -hmm. Why am I learning more on TikTok than I ever learned in my classroom? And it's not necessarily that none of this was ever addressed, although in some cases it really wasn't in certain communities. So address those things that the students really feel connected and compelled by. But beyond that, it wasn't addressed in a way that was, you know, dates on a board of history, as opposed to let's go ahead and really uh, dive into the tragedies and, and difficulties that American communities faced and battled with each other throughout our long history, right? And tell it as stories, meaningful stories that connect through video, through audio, through through meaningful visualizations in a way that really reaches out and, and connects to people, you know, not just words on a page or words on a blackboard. It goes back to what you started this conversation with, which was student engagement, right? And getting mm -hmm. them actively involved in their learning. Um, so yeah, I think that, I mean, you just kind of told a nice little story arc there, all connected together. <laughs> Well, and, and engagement isn't a word that translates to fun either, right? A lot of times people think, oh, I don't have to be fun. Yeah, it's not about cotton candy. We're not giving right. cotton candy to kids, right? But it is about, and I think rule number one of being a good educator is knowing your students well. Sometimes that's hard if you have like 300 kids you see in a week, right? But if you know your students well, then you can connect to, yes, their needs, right? And for my students who all have IEPs and are in smaller groups, it's perhaps a little easier, but you can also see who they are as a human being and what they're passionate about and what empowers their, their search in life. And, and maybe, you know, they're really young and it's something as simple as, you know, uh, I really love uh, 
it was Caillou when I was a kid, who's super annoying in this little character, or the Bear Insane Bears, or whatever it was when I was younger. Or it, it's something much more cool and massive, like my kids are super into Roblox and Minecraft. And they connect and socialize with their friends on those platforms. Okay, so let's let's make use of it and let's recognize that actually, you know, gaming is an industry that's bigger than the film industry and bigger than all American sports. And let's not, you know, look at it as some small degrading thing that's not meaningful and purposeful. And it's actually an awesome place where lots of young people can have future careers and be successful and be amazing human beings and actually build games that make the world a better place. Because there's a whole organization called Games for Change that works on creating structures and things. And I know Minecraft has been a big part of an organization on building things that address real problems in the world, whether it's a, a influx of Syrian refugees or it's disability or it's underserved communities of color. Yeah. And that could be their future in an awesome way that a lot of people who are my age or somewhat older might not have considered because it wasn't in our future back then when I was growing up. Well, if I could bottle you up, Sean, and, you know, re rewind time a little bit and make sure that my my child got to be part of your learning experience, that would be uh, would be great. But uh, but since we can't, you know, I can't bottle you up in reverse time and make that happen. Since, you know, I don't know. We're not I'll later. work on that project later. All right. Oh, uh, yes. Ne next project. Uh, I, I did want to share that you also do have a, a blog where you do a lot of the, you do a lot of storytelling, you, you know, share some of these great examples and for people to be able to continue to learn from you. So I just want to kind of put that out there. Um, for those that are listening in to to check out Sean's blogs, look at some of his creative ideas that he's done. You know, um, if, if you're working with educators inside your own school district to you're trying to get a, to adopt change, reach out to Sean, connect with him on social. He's great to, to reach out and connect to. But I think he keeps it real and, is, and always takes it back to the why. Um, it's not about the shiny technology tool or the shiny new gadget to put in the classroom or new fancy bulletin board to display, right? It's it's really about what are you trying to do with your students? Why why is the you know learning engagement so important? And then choosing the right tool, whatever that tool is, to meet the students where they are. So um, thank you so much for all that you're doing and leading the way. I mean, you're just a great example of what all um, you know K-12 school leaders should bottle up your energy and try to replicate you we'll go into cloning next you know since we talk about robotics and gaming sure, yeah. that's a I, i'm not sure that that's legal yet but, but we, can, we can deal with the legal ramifications down yeah. the road you know of human cloning forget that sure. but better to have your uh hand slapped and ask for permission right just you know just right. go ahead and do i mean it that's we'll that's that been the story of my educational career i believe <laughs> yeah. love it yeah always always be honest and always be upfront and recognize that challenges and struggles that you know we're all facing here honestly uh, to that end uh, you saw that the blog was called brave in the attempt which which is based on the uh slogan for the special olympics um which basically says you know you may not always win but you can always be brave in the attempt right uh, and to that end we will not always win and always be successful especially not on our first try and we will struggle and we will stumble and we will fall as like gladiators in the arena but we can always bravely attempt and forge ahead and try out these new things because if you're not challenged and somewhat uncomfortable yes in a classroom with your students whether you are a student or whether you're a teacher and and i mean in that realm of uncomfortability where we're good challenge right like roller coaster kind of challenge right if you like roller coasters if you're not at least a little uncomfortable, you're not growing. You're not learning. That's the story of life. That is. Well, Sean, we uh, want to see if you're up for a few lightning round questions before um, we officially let you go. And then we're going to right. stay around for a little bit and recognize uh, some epic educators that we saw out on the web this, this week. But um, if, are, you, are you down for some lightning round? Sure. I'll give it a shot. All right. Um, I'll, I'm a little I'll nervous, give... but that's good, right? Yeah, nah, this is easy, easy peasy. Uh, I'll mm -hmm. give it a start. So right now on your phone, what is the most used app? Honestly, probably Pokemon Go, at <laughs> yes. least recently. I mean, I stopped playing for a good while during the pandemic, but it's it's nice on the subway, catch some Pokemon on the subway, listen to music and, and some podcasts <laughs> and some audiobooks, and play some Pokemon Go. All at the same time. And it also 
Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a multitasker. <laughs> like on a nice day like today, I can go out for lunch real briefly, get some fresh air, and go for a walk and feel like you know I'm doing something while I'm walking. It's motivated me to get outside more than I might have otherwise. So that's a really good part of it. Well, as someone who was a deep fan of geocaching back in the day, I get it. I, I got. It. <laughs> totally. uh, all right, next quick one. If you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would you want to be? I mean, I'm enjoying this right here and now. But you know, if I weren't here, um, you know, and I could bring my family with you, I've never been to Australia, and I've always wanted to visit Australia and Japan, two places I've never been. So I guess Tokyo or Sydney, maybe. All right. Yeah, that sounds like a, you know, you said spring break's coming up for you. So, you know, nothing like a last minute trip. There you go. Sure. Book it. <laughs> uh, all right. You, you talked a little bit about family. So I know family is important to you. Uh, what's the one, what's your favorite family holiday tradition? Oh, I mean, we don't do a lot of big traditions or anything. Um, I mean, we enjoy Halloween and we always have a group costume. So I guess like putting together and making these sort of group costumes that we do, which are different themed every year. Like, you know, one year we're all just different food items you might find at, at, at uh, a movie theater. Another year we're Pokemon characters. Another year we're all pirates. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's always fun because it's, it's a group sort of family project that we put together and visually compelling. Anybody who wants a picture of that, let me know and I'll share some. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, a couple more for you. Uh, during quarantine, if you had the time amongst all the projects that you're working on, uh, did you pick up any new hobbies or new things to kind of occupy time for yourself? I, I had. Like, I heard these stories of people who were knitting and, and baking bread and all that kind of It's like, <laughs> I, I, I was working like 24-7 in a lot of ways, in, in unhealthy ways that I've since gotten better about and taken time to move and exercise. I, I picked up my guitar much more again. And so in my momentary respites, you know, I've, I've, I've been noodling on my guitar a good deal more. And, and I guess I've gotten uh, reacquainted with my guitar skills. So there's that. And we will get you out of here on this last question. Who in your life right now inspires you the most? Inspires me the most? Well, I mean, usually it's immediately in my life. And right now my youngest son, is making me super happy every day because we've gotten to this sort of tradition of, of like the wordle and then the worldle and then the hurdle and and those sort of <laughs> variations and one so one's with music and one's geography and yeah. i've been amazingly impressed with things i didn't realize he was so adept at uh especially the worldle where he's, he's naming these countries across the world and i was like wow your geography knowledge and your linguistic knowledge is it's much more impressive than I realized. And, and, you know, we're high-fiving each other when we get them and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's been a wonderful time. So on a small scale, like I said, sometimes those small moments, I think, are much more meaningful than, you know, huge things that people can tell. And that's been meaningful for me. Yeah. So he inspires me to feel like, okay, I think there might be some hope in the midst of all of this. <laughs> Seeing some young people do that. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Well, we appreciate having you on tonight, Sean. Thanks so much for joining us. And and honestly, just thanks for being you and being the amazing educator that you are, the leader that you are, and um, for inspiring not only all of your learners, but a large, vast global community of educators um, each and every day. And we're just grateful to have you as part of our MIE expert family. And, uh, you know, hope that we can continue to learn from you each and every thanks day. Thanks so much for having me. This was lovely. Appreciate you, Sean. Have a great night. Bye, all. Bye, Sean. And speaking of ed epic educators, we do want to, uh, as always, recognize a few of our um, amazing things that we've seen out on the web uh, the past recent couple of weeks. So um, over to you, Scott, to recognize our first couple of educators. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually on two other calls today that referenced this first one. So I thought it was really, really cool. Um, we're super excited to read and hear more about, actually, because more will be coming soon, this uh, case study from the team at Minecraft in partnership with our friend Nadine Ebry and Duval County Schools. They have what looks like the most amazing Minecraft lab. I don't know if you got to look at this picture today, Robin, on social, but definitely check it out. It's state of the art. I mean, obviously, it's new, too, so everything looks clean and tidy, but 
what they're going to be able to do with Minecraft in education at Duval County Schools is really, really impressive. And we also wanted to make sure you point out, uh, do follow Nadine. It's just uh, at her name. So at Nadine Ebery. Uh, she's got some great shares of all the amazing work they're doing with Minecraft um, in, in her county schools. Really, really cool. And looking forward to seeing that case study when it comes out. Very cool. Next up is Jackie Cavanaugh from up in Sean's part of the world in New York. Um, just another great reminder, again, more Minecraft, but just of, of the different ways that students can learn and experience. Uh, and it brought up something from our good friend, Stephen Reed from actually a few years ago. And I'll put the link on the screen of his world that you can download. But again, not a, not a great story, but one that is certainly in the news with everything going on in the Ukraine. Um, and this world that Stephen created about, um, you know, managing crisis with refugees in the moment. And it's been updated a little bit. So you can go to the link you see there. And we'll, of course, add that to our resources as well and share on social media. But we appreciate Jackie calling this out and just reminding us how there's ways to learn more than just having a teacher lecture or reading an article or showing something at us that students can actually experience, you know, what it's like to be a refugee in crisis through, through a world like this in Minecraft. Really, really cool. Very eye-opening experiences for our students. Absolutely. And, and like you said, not a not a sit and get, listen to someone talk about, but let, let, let's actually go in and experience it, that experiential learning, that hands-on learning that Sean was right. talking about. So important. Right. And then the last one we're going to recognize is Jackie Haynes from uh, Pennsylvania. Um, this one really wanted to recognize is just the sheer amount of growth that her students have had by um, leveraging uh, reading progress. So just kudos to Jackie and her group uh, of second graders who've really been leveraging reading progress. And again, it's not about the technology tool. She you know, was addressing a learning need for her students and helping them with literacy and improving their, their reading uh, outcomes. So you can take a look at this tweet here and you can follow Jackie too, Jackie Haynes 17 on Twitter, I encourage you to follow her, but you can see, look at, by looking at this data, at the, the beginning of the uh, school year, the students were where they were in, in the blue levels. And then as where they are now in the orange levels and how they're advancing uh, their reading proficiency throughout the year by leveraging, you know, reading tools, which are built into the, the platform inside of Teams. Uh, and, you know, not only are the students growing, but they're actually let the teacher is able to use this tool that is letting the technology do a lot of the work that they were having to, in the past, pull students out of the classroom or work in small groups and just required a lot of teacher time and individual time with students. And now, you know, going back to that time aspect and how time is so valuable. Yes, the kids are growing in their, their literacy skills, but then also the teacher is gaining back so much time, not having to administer all those small minute things and letting the technology do that. So she can spend time with those kids. And like, and like Sean said, you know, learn, learn about what gets them excited. What are they passionate yeah. about? What, you know, what do they do on the weekends? What, what is their community priorities? Like all the things that the kids want to tell you and share with you that you don't sometimes not feel like you have time to hear all those details. You can get that time back to hear that details when you're, you're, uh, you know, redirecting things that you used to do that took you a lot of time. So shout out to Jackie. I really look forward to seeing where your kids continue to go. And, um, and thanks for, you know, giving something new a try. Yeah. And, and amazing. Sean mentioned this too, the idea of learner independence, right? It's amazing what tools like this, when they're put into play in a classroom that supports that, how it does create that independent learning environment. We don't have to have all 35 kids on the same pace at the same time. They can really move at their own pace. And this data is incredible in six or seven months to have students move, you know, that far to the right. It's just, just really wonderful. I agree. Well, and, as always, I you know I just really enjoyed having uh, Sean on tonight and hearing his, his view. He is uh, such a gem and so much, more to continue to learn from him. So definitely connect with Sean, uh, post this vodcast, connect with him out on social media. Uh, definitely check out his blog, but uh, he's something special. And I'm just really grateful that we were able to have him on our show tonight. Totally agree. And we will continue these conversations with another great educator. Nathan Wells will be with us in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to chatting with him as well. 
And uh, as always, uh, Robin, everybody can catch past episodes, including tonight. If you missed a piece, you can rewind. Maybe you're watching on demand right now. You can always catch on our YouTube channel there at aka.ms backslash US Microsoft EDU live. All right. Well, I think we have a wrap. It's been uh, great connecting again, Scott, and have, hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and look forward to our next show in just a couple of weeks with Nathan. Absolutely. Great to see you as always, Robin, and we'll chat soon. Good night, everyone. Take care, everybody.